Hello again, everyone. Welcome to Washington Gun Law TV. I am Washington Gun Law President William Kirk. Thanks for joining us. Hey, occasionally you start sitting down to geek out about a video, start doing a bunch of homework, and then you find a little nugget in a brief somewhere or something like that, and you go, oh my God, that's what we need to talk about. And this is one of these moments. Bunch of you had asked me about what's going on with the pistol brace rule. I wanted to talk about the pistol brace rule as much as I want to talk about solvent traps, which is I don't want to talk about it. But I was doing my homework because, hey, I try to be a man of the people, right? And in looking at the two motions for summary judgment, because that's what's going on with the pistol brace rule right now in the case of Mock v. Garland, Mock is asking for a summary judgment. The United States government is asking for a summary judgment. But, but one of the arguments that the United States government is making is, hey, this thing's about taxation too, right? These items are supposed to be NFA items, items with attached stabilizing braces are actually SBRs, therefore it's about taxation, and therefore you can't join that. And what the plaintiffs here, the Firearms Policy Coalition, are arguing is, is, hey, you know what? Maybe this whole taxation and registration thing might be unconstitutional. Hmm, you ever think about that? That's what we're gonna geek out about today because I think that this argument has some legs. So today, let's spend a few minutes and let's talk about the roadmap for striking down the NFA. You know, I bet you wish you could go and do this every day, but you don't, do you? And I imagine you wish your groups looked a lot like this, but they don't, do they? No, instead they have a tendency to look a little bit more like this. Plus you might've noticed that this stuff ain't very cheap anymore. Or just hear me out, you can use your Mantis X10 Elite training system like I do. Listen, this thing is way too easy to use. Step one, install the Mantis training app to your smartphone. Step two, install the Mantis X10 Elite training system to your firearm. It's as simple as this. Step three, open up the training app, select your program, and away you go. Listen, you can practice in the comfort of your own home. This app will store all the data. It will tell you what you're doing wrong, what you're doing right. It will tell you what you're improving on and what you need to work on. The best part is all you need is your firearm and the Mantis X10. You don't need any ammunition and you don't need any expensive membership to a range or a gun club. And right now, if you wanna check this revolutionary system out, all you gotta do is click on that link right up there. For more information, visit our good friends at mantisx.com. Okay, this is what we're talking about sort of today. We're talking about Mock v. Garland. This is a case that challenges the constitutionality and legality of ATF's rule on firearms with attached stabilizing braces, better known as the pistol brace rule, better known as a rule that we've talked way too much about on this channel. Now, both sides are asking for summary judgments. That's the subject of a whole nother video. We can geek out on that later. I happen to be reading the plaintiff's motion for summary judgment, that is Mock's motion for summary judgment, brought to you by our good friends at the Firearms Policy Coalition. So we're gonna put a link down below so that all of you, and you should do this, show them some love. However, as you know, one of the things that the United States and the ATF is arguing here is, hey, listen, this isn't really just about a firearm regulation. This is about a form of taxation, okay? This is about regulation and taxation. And these firearms with these stabilizing braces are really SBRs. We should be taxing them and we're losing revenue. And there's actually law out there that says you can't enjoin certain tax revenue statutes. You can duke it out about the constitutionality of it, but you don't enjoin it while it's being duked out. We're not gonna get into that either, okay? And the Firearms Policy Coalition says, you know, now that you bring that up, yeah, maybe we should take a look at the NFA and examine it under the lens of the Bruin test now. Because, well, gosh, the NFA was passed in 1934. Um, the courts have consistently said that the relevant time periods are either 1792 or 1868. So this comes well after that. And when I go, we go back and we take a look at the historical analogs, which would justify registration and taxation of certain firearms somewhere in the 1790s or the 1860s, well, we don't find anything, okay? And when pressed on it, the ATF came up with some type of historical analogs to try to justify it. But as we oftentimes see with more, as we call it, modern gun regulations is there is no historical analogs. And so the ATF floundered miserably in their arguments trying to support the constitutionality of what they were doing. Now to just give you a few of the highlights 
of how the plaintiffs here, the Firearms Policy Coalition, picked apart the registration requirement. They did it as follows. The agencies first identify six colonial era militia regulations, but they fail both Bruins' how and why metrics. First, the how of these regulations are different. Taking a survey of what arms and ammunition colonial Americans already possess or inspecting militia members' arms to ensure their proper function is different in kind than the NFA's gatekeeping restrictions on the possession of regulated arms. Second, these laws serve an entirely different why. Each was directed at ensuring that colonial militia were adequately and appropriately armed, not at dissuading individuals from acquiring certain arms. The final rule and the NFA are explicitly designed to disarm or heavily regulate a particular class of firearms that the government disfavors based on unfounded assumptions about dangerousness. And then they point out how further they failed miserably by relying on proving laws out of Maine and Massachusetts. It was just a law where a manufacturer would have to prove that the firearm wasn't going to blow up in someone's face. It was actually a functional firearm before they could place it on the market. Of course, they also tried to rely on much more modern regulations, those that post-date the ratification of the 14th Amendment, and plaintiffs pointed out, Finally, the agencies point to two laws from the late 19th century requiring the registration of certain firearms. These laws are obviously not representative as they come too late to inform the meaning of the Second Amendment. In short, the agencies have failed to meet their burden of showing that there is a historical tradition of firearm registration requirement to justify the final rule and the NFA. And that's just on the registration part. What about taxation? What sort of historical tradition do we have about taxing the owners of a particular type of firearm? This is how the Firearms Policy Coalition dealt with that. The historical regulations the agencies attempt to analogize as a tradition of taxation fare no better. The agencies start off with four colonial regulations focused on the inspection and sale of gunpowder. However, they fail Bruins' how and why test. On the House side, these laws were quality control laws that restricted the commercial sale of gunpowder both through inspection requirements and by requiring vendors to be licensed. The final rule, by contrast, burdens the possession of a class of weapons writ large. The gunpowder regulations also serve a distinctly different why. These colonial regulations were enacted to ensure that gunpowder sold to the public met basic quality standards. The final rule, by contrast, is motivated by the agency's desire to push brace pistols out of the market. At bottom, the gunpowder regulations have nothing in common with the final rule. And the plaintiffs point out, listen, you know you're getting desperate when you start citing to racist gun control laws. The agencies illustrate how bare the historical record is by turning to four colonial laws restricting the sale of firearms and ammunition to Native Americans, claiming that these laws are evidence of strict regulations regarding where and to whom some firearms could be sold. Because these laws were discriminatory and targeted a small subset of the population, they should be left in the dustbin of history and not used as tools to restrict the rights in the modern day. And let us remember how much easier it would have been to disarm individuals who are not considered to be part of the people as protected by the Constitution. An argument which, by the way, I will point out that the ATF routinely makes, as does many other civilian disarmament regimes. As the plaintiffs point out, moreover, at the time, Native Americans were not considered to be among the people protected under the Constitution, and thus colonial era law aimed at them are no guide as to how the Constitution should be interpreted to apply to the people today. So here's the thing, everyone. When we take a look at the National Firearms Act, and we truly do analyze it, under the Bruin analysis test as set forth in New York Pistol and Rifle Association v. Bruin, the government is going to be in a position where they must justify both the registration and special taxation of certain platforms of firearms. They will have to do so using historical analogs that go all the way back to the late 1700s or the 1860s at latest. There are none whatsoever. And this is ultimately, this two and a half 
pages in Mock v. Garland, authored by the Firearms Policy Coalition, is the genesis of which an argument will grow and may ultimately prove successful to overturn the National Firearms Act. Listen, we'll go ahead and link up the brief down below so that you can geek out on it for yourself. If you got any other questions about this or anything else related to what's left of our Second Amendment rights, you guys should know how to get a hold of Washington Gun Law by now. If you don't, that's okay. That information is down there in the description box. And then finally, let's remember that part of being the lawful and responsible gun owner, like we talk about all the time, is to know what the law is in every situation, how it applies to you in any instance that you may find yourself. Until next time, thanks for watching. Stay safe.